Hello, Mrs H here. This is part two of the 2018 exam paper one walkthrough. Question three, the circulatory system is composed of the blood, blood vessels and the heart. Urea is transported in the blood plasma. Um, name two other substances transported in the blood plasma. So I would go for carbon dioxide and water as my two. Uh, and you must only put two, but there are other examples you could have put, such as glucose, amino acids, lactic acid, but you can't put oxygen because oxygen is bound up in the haemoglobin of a red blood cell, so it's not actually loose in the plasma. 3.2, some athletes train at high altitude. Training at high altitude increases the number of red blood cells per centimeters cubed of blood. Explain why having more red blood cells per centimeter cubed of blood is an advantage to an athlete. Well, that will mean there's more hemoglobin, therefore more oxygen can be transported to respiring cells, for example, muscle cells. The more oxygen the muscle cells have, the more respiration occurs, which means more energy is released for the muscle cells to work better. There are three marks going, so the main points being marked here are more haemoglobin, more respiration and more energy being released. And of course, you never ever say energy is produced. Uh, because energy can't be produced. So just remember, energy is transferred or released. 3.3, which two blood vessels carry deoxygenated blood? So that means blood without oxygen in it. And we can remember this little rhyme, is not really a rhyme, but arteries take blood away from the heart, A and A, and veins bring blood to the heart, veins in, blood into the heart. That does help us when we're labelling the heart. The aorta carries oxygenated blood pumped from the left ventricle and it's an artery. The coronary artery branches off of the aorta and carries oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself. Pulmonary means lungs and we know that arteries take blood away from the heart, meaning if it's a pulmonary artery, it's taking blood away from the heart and to the lungs. There, the blood will fill up with oxygen. So in the pulmonary artery, there is no oxygenated blood there. It's deoxygenated. Once in the lungs, the blood will fill up with oxygen and it will come back to the heart from the lungs. So that's going to be fully oxygenated. So it is the vena cava, which is a very large vein, is going to bring deoxygenated blood back from the rest of the body to the heart so that can be pumped to the lungs again to fill up with oxygen. Figure four shows three types of blood vessels, A, B, C. Which type of blood vessel carries blood into the right atrium? Into the right atrium. Atrium is part of the heart, isn't it? And it's going in. So we know a vein carries blood into the heart. So we now have to work out which one, A, B or C, is a vein. Well, A is an artery. How can we tell? It has thick wall, which is made of upper of elastic tissue and muscle so that it can withstand the high pressure. And a B is a vein. It's about the same overall diameter of an artery, but it has a much wider lumen, that's the hole that the blood moves through, and a thinner wall, so have thinner uh, elastic tissue and muscle. And then C is very tiny, it's only one cell thick, so we know that's the capillary. The answer to 3.4 is B. 3.5, compare the structure of an artery with the structure of a vein. We already did this a little bit, so let's just write the answer down. Arteries have a thicker layer of muscle in their walls compared to veins. 
Arteries have a thicker layer of elastic tissue in their walls compared to a vein. We should note that we won't get any extra marks for writing that veins have thinner layers if we've already written about the fact arteries have thicker layers because it's the same marking point. You also need to write that arteries have a narrower lumen compared to veins or that veins have a wider lumen. The lumen is the space that the blood moves through. Arteries do not have valves and veins have valves. 3.6, heart rate is controlled by a group of cells. This group of cells act as a pacemaker. Figure five shows a section through the heart. Draw an X on figure five to show the position of the pacemaker. Remember which side is left and right. Imagine the heart is someone else's heart and it is their left and their right. The pacemaker is found in the wall of the right atrium, so we'll put a cross here. 3.7, a patient may be fitted with an artificial pacemaker. What condition may be treated using an artificial pacemaker? That will be an irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia. Question four, a student carried out an investigation using chicken eggs. This is the method used. Number one, place five eggs in acid for 24 hours to dissolve the eggshell. Two, measure and record the mass of each egg. Three, place each egg into a separate beaker containing 200 centimetres cubed of distilled water. Four, after 20 minutes, remove the eggs from the beakers and dry them gently with a paper towel. Five, measure and record the mass of each egg. Right, so the eggshell was completely removed. Then we measured the mass of each egg, popped it into distilled water, left it for 20 minutes, then measured the mass again. Right, got it. And there are five eggs and the table is showing the mass before putting it in water and the mass after putting it in water. 4.1, another student suggested the result for egg four was anomalous. Do you agree with the student? Give a reason for your answer. You need to look at the table and you need to work out the differences for each egg to see if you can make a comment here. So if we do uh, the difference between egg one before and after, that's minus 3.5. For egg two, it's a decrease of 3.6 grams. For egg three, it's a decrease of 3.3 grams. For egg four, it's a decrease of 1.5 gram. For egg five is a decrease of 3.3 grams. So yeah, egg four does look anomalous. It's actually almost half of the other decreases. So our answer would be yes, egg four result was anomalous because the mass change of egg four is much lower than the others. Question 4.2, calculate the percentage change in mass of egg three. We need to remember the equation for this. So to work out percentage change is change in mass divided by the original mass times 100. If we look back on the table to get our data for egg three, the change in mass, we already worked that out, was a decrease of 3.3 grams divided by its original mass, which was 72.4, and then times that by 100. We can ignore the negative sign. We know it's a decrease in mass, so we'll just get our answer, which is 4.558 or 4.56 or 4.6. Because you get a long number, you do have to round it up. And for this question, the examiner hasn't said how many significant figures to round it up to or decimal places. So that's why for this question, they will accept three possible answers. Explain why the masses of the eggs increase. So if we have a look at the data all of the eggs did increase in mass after being left in water for 20 minutes. 
Remember, they had their shells removed, so they were only surrounded by water. And when you get a question and there's water involved, it's usually going to be about osmosis. And that is exactly what has happened. So water moved into the egg by osmosis. The water molecules will move from a high water concentration in the beaker to a lower water concentration in the egg through a partially permeable membrane. So remember this stock answer for your osmosis questions. Remember to talk about the water molecules, the movement from the high water concentration to low water concentration and through a partially permeable membrane and you should get your three marks. 4.4, explain how the student could modify the investigation to determine the concentration of the solution inside the egg. This is a really hard question, but do you remember the required practical where you measured the mass of potato chips before placing each chip in a different concentration of sugar solution? Then when you measured the mass again after the chips had been soaking for a while, you found some chips had gained mass and some had lost mass? Let's change the chips to eggs. So if we place the eggs in five different concentrations of sugar solution and measure their mass before and after, we could calculate their percentage change and then plot this onto a graph. I'll sketch one, you don't have to do that, but it's just to help you remember. Percentage change in mass on the y-axis with increase and decrease and concentration of sugar solution on the x-axis. Plot the points, draw a curve or straight line of best fit. All of these chips increased in mass at these concentrations of sugar solution because water moved into the eggs. All of these eggs decreased in mass because water moved out. But if we use this concentration of sugar solution, we can see that there's no change in mass and that is because no water has moved in or out, meaning there's not a high water concentration and low water concentration anywhere. They're exactly the same water concentration on the outside of the egg compared to the inside of the egg, which means the solution concentration is the same inside and outside. So we would write the point where the curved line of best fit crosses the X axis is the concentration of sugar solution where there is no movement of water molecules where there is no percentage change in mass. Thus, meaning the concentration inside and outside of the egg is the same. A very hard question. Check back at your required practical on osmosis in the potato chips. Chicken egg shells contain calcium. Calcium ions are moved from the shell into the cytoplasm of the egg. Table five shows information about the concentration of calcium ions. So we've got our location, our eggshell and cytoplasm, and then the concentration of calcium ions in arbitrary units. So the eggshell has a lower concentration of calcium than the cytoplasm. Right, okay, so 4.5, explain how calcium ions are moved from the shell into the cytoplasm of the egg? I think that can be a bit of a misleading question, but you just need to think, well, how do ions move? They either move by diffusion or active transport. So as we've established, they are a lower concentration in the shell compared to the cytoplasm. If they're moving into the cytoplasm, they're gonna be moving from a low concentration to a higher concentration. So therefore, active transport is needed. So the calcium ions are moved from an area of low concentration to a high concentration by active transport, which requires energy. We have all our lovely three marks in that answer. Question number five. Plants can be infected by fungi, viruses and insects. Aphids are small insects that carry pathogens Figure six shows an aphid feeding from a plant stem. Yep, it's got a nice sharp mouthpiece. Great. 5.1. An aphid feeds by inserting its sharp mouthpiece into the stem of a plant. 
Give the reason why the mouthpiece of an aphid contains a high concentration of dissolved sugars after feeding. Well, we need to remember that glucose is made in the leaves during photosynthesis and then transported to other parts of the plant, if it's not used in respiration, that is, transported to other parts of the plant via the phloem. Not relevant, but just while we're here, do you remember the xylem transports water and minerals? Anyway, if the aphid contains a high concentration of sugars after feeding, then its mouthpiece must have pierced the phloem. And that's what our answer is. 5.2. Plants infected with aphids may show symptoms of magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency symptoms include yellow leaves and stunted growth. Explain how a deficiency of magnesium could cause these symptoms. Well, yellow leaves means there is a lack of chlorophyll. This means less light can be absorbed, so there will be less photosynthesis, meaning the plant will have less glucose. And if there's less glucose, then less is converted into other substances such as plant protein. So this can lead to stunted growth. Or if there is less glucose, the plant will respire less and there won't be as much energy to make bigger molecules from smaller molecules, i.e. there will be less growth. Question 5.3. A farmer thinks a potato crop is infected with potato virus Y, PVY. The farmer obtains a monoclonal antibody test kit for PVY. To make the monoclonal antibodies, a scientist first isolates the PVY protein from the virus Describe how the scientist would use the protein to produce the PVY monoclonal antibody. Before we answer the question, I thought we'd do a quick recap as to how we actually make monoclonal antibodies. So here is our mouse, and if we inject the mouse with PVY proteins, the mouse is going to have an immune response to that because that is antigenic to the mouse. It shouldn't be in the mouse. It will make phagocytes, it will make lymphocytes, there'll be antibodies, but we need to extract the lymphocytes from the mouse. So extract the lymphocytes that can make antibodies and then fuse those with tumor cells. That way we can make cells that can keep dividing like tumor cells and also make lots of antibodies that we want. These cells that have been made by fusing the lymphocytes that can make antibodies with tumor cells are called hybridomas. And that's a key word you must put into your answers. So we will have different hybridomas and we need to select the correct hybridoma that is going to give us the antibodies against PVY. Hopefully that little recap helped. Even though we've learned how to make monoclonal antibodies in the context of using a pregnancy hormone, the method is still the same. We're just using PVY instead of the pregnancy hormone. So the answer is inject the protein into a mouse, Combine the lymphocytes with tumor cells to make hybridomas. Select and check that the hybridomas are making the PVY antibodies. Then make more clones of the hybridoma making PVY antibodies. Uh, some common mistakes here are uh, extract the antibodies from the mouse and fuse those with the tumor cell. No, you have to fuse the B lymphocyte, the lymphocyte that makes antibodies, with a tumour cell and that is what makes the hybridoma. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it useful. Don't forget to tune in for part three. Please like and subscribe for more content and don't forget to check out biologybreakdown.co.uk.